equated with excess The ambition for excess wrecks us As the top of the mind becomes the bottom line oh, When success is equated with excess If you're time it but nothing for money I start to feel really bad for you, honey Baby, honey, put your money where your mouth's been running If your time ain't been nothing but money I want out of this machine It doesn't feel like freedom This ain't my American dream I want to live and die for bigger things I'm tired of fighting for just Fighting for the Beamer, the Lexus As our heart and soul breathe out the company goals Where success is equated with excess well, I want out of this machine It doesn't feel like freedom This ain't my American dream I want to live and die for bigger Hey, good morning and welcome here to Christ Community Church. How are you guys doing this morning? Doing okay? Well, my name is Jared and I'm the college pastor here. And we, are excited, we are excited to be here um, because we're in the second week of our series called The Illusion of More. If you were here last week, we heard from Harris III and this morning we're going to hear from our own lead pastor, Mark Ashen. I don't think he's going to be doing any magic tricks, but I'm not sure. I haven't seen it yet, so I guess we'll see. But hey, before we do anything else, I want to invite you to stand up, uh, say hi to someone next to you, introduce yourself, and then we'll continue in a minute. Good to see everybody here today. Let's go ahead and lift up our voices and sing this out. You are good, you are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all. You 
sing it out together. Here we go. Oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever Flood this place 
amen. Holy Spirit, just like we prayed, let your presence fill this place today. We know that you are with us always, so help us to become more aware of your presence in our lives. Move in us, move through us, Lord. Help us to meet with you here today. Open our hearts and our minds, God, to the truth of what will be uh, presented later today by Pastor Mark. And help us meet you wherever we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. I don't know about you guys, but I just love that last song. It, it helps me to just pause for a second and just remember that the almighty God, the creator of the universe, is, is here with us. And he's trying to, to speak to us, to tell us something as we're here this morning. And he's listening to us as we're worshiping him. That's just a, a cool thought, isn't it? So as we continue on in our worship this morning, we're going to worship through giving. And so I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward at this time. And I think, uh, you know, this is a something that we do every single week, but I think it's good sometimes to pause and to remember what we're doing. And that we're taking something that's really near and dear to our hearts and our finances, something that we hold on to pretty tightly, and we're saying, okay, God, uh, this is yours anyway, and so I'm just going to give it to you. I trust you with this. And so that's the attitude that we want to have as we're giving here this morning. And so if you're a, a newcomer here, if you're just visiting us, feel no obligation whatsoever to give. Uh, but if you do call Christ Community Church home, we'd love to invite you to give to the baskets, or you can give online, or you can text an amount to the number that's up there on the screens. As we uh, receive this morning's offering, we have a couple key things that we wanted you to know about. And so check this out. At Christ Community, people matter. In fact, one of our greatest hopes is that each person who walks through our doors feels welcomed, loved, and included into the community of what God is doing here. We also understand that it's not always easy to get connected, especially when you're new. That's why we've created the Next Steps area out in the atrium. There are three simple steps to take that will help you get plugged into all the great things happening here at CCC. First step, go to starting point. At Starting Point, you can pick up some information about Christ Community and go on an optional tour of our campus to get a feel for where everything is located. Right next to Starting Point is a place called Group Link, where you can get connected into a small group community we call Journey Groups. Journey Groups meet throughout the week in the entire city, so there's sure to be a group that will work for you and for your schedule. And finally, if you'd like to learn more about what it means to follow Jesus or if you're considering making Christ Community your official church home by becoming a member, we have a three-week class available called Foundation. All three of these steps can be found out in the atrium at our Next Steps area. One of the things we love most at Christ Community is seeing people come to faith in Jesus Christ, then publicly profess that faith through baptism. You might be asking, what is baptism? Well, baptism is simply an outward expression of the inward change that happens when you say yes to following Jesus. When you get baptized, you're saying, I have trusted my life with Jesus, and I want the world to know. By being baptized, we symbolically identify with Jesus in his death and resurrection. Our old self dies, and our new life rises as our sins are washed away. On Sunday, November 15th at 6 p.m., we are having a special service to celebrate with those who are making the decision to follow Jesus and be baptized. This is an all-church celebration, so we want all of you to be here that night. We'll hear great stories of faith, respond with powerful music, and give God glory for the redemptive work He's doing in our midst. If you'd like to be baptized, sign up online at cccomaha.org slash baptism or sign up at the baptism booth out in the atrium today after service. Once you're signed up, you'll be contacted about attending one of our brief baptism orientation classes on either Sunday, November 8th or 15th.
Hey, well, you heard it right there. We're having an all-church baptism celebration next Sunday night, so we want you to clear your calendars. Uh, come, on, uh, come on out, and let's celebrate what Jesus has been doing in the lives of individuals here. I think it's going to be a fun party, so come on out and celebrate with us. And I have one uh, additional thing to add with that, and that is if, uh, if you're here this morning and you've placed your faith in Jesus, but you've never taken that next step of baptism, you've never publicly proclaimed that, uh, I want to encourage you to just think about that and ask God, God, are you, are you asking me to do that? If you're in that place and you're kind of wrestling with that, uh, after this service, you can go out into the atrium and there's a baptism booth there and you can get your questions answered. Uh, they can help you get signed up for next week. So I would ask you to prayerfully consider that as we're gathered here this morning. So as we mentioned uh, a little while back, we are in the second week in our series called The Illusion of more, and so we're going to be able to hear from our lead pastor, Mark Ashton, in just a second. But before we do that, uh, allow me to pray for us. God, we thank you uh, that you are here with us today, that you're trying to open up our hearts and our minds um, to what you have to offer us, which is better than anything that we could come up with on our own, any illusion that we could fall for. God, uh, we pray that you would uh, speak powerfully, and God, that you would give us faith to respond to you as we hear your word preached to us. God, we're so thankful that you are a God who loves us, who cares about us, who wants, uh, who wants us to flourish in our lives. And so, God, would you draw us in? Would you give us obedient hearts to respond to what you're saying? God, we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. All of a sudden we began to wonder. I wonder if there's more out there. I wonder if there's something that I'm not experiencing, even though God created us in this perfect condition to have the fullness of joy in who he is. And even though Adam and Eve had perfection in the entire Garden of Eden, they still reached for the illusion of more. The rest of the narrative of the Bible is the tragic human story of you and I over and over and over again, being reminded by God that he has created us to live out this amazing plan and purpose rooted in the truth of who he is. And we exchange the truth of God for a lie, we reach for the illusion of more, and then we decide to settle. Because it's a lot easier sometimes to just settle for a fake counterfeit version of the life that God created us to live out. All right, well, it was very cool last week to have Harris III here doing his thing, and congratulations to all of you for doing such a great job of inviting. Welcome to those of you who are new, who have come back this week again. Let's just give God a hand for giving us a great weekend and a great time, and for all the folks who are entering into a spiritual process as a result of that happening. So glad for that, and I'm so glad for the message that Harris brought, that so many of us just settle for an illusion. You know, settle that as, as if what we're experiencing in the substance of life is all there is. But the truth of the matter is that God has so much more for us than the illusion that's out there. And if you'll align yourself with the truth, you'll discover a certain depth and riches that you never knew was possible before that you can experience in Jesus. Because it's true that so many people out there settle for the illusion. They settle for a fake persona or something that's second best. And I know a lot of people who are just sick of playing the game. They yearn for more authenticity. One of those people is Asina O'Neill. This week, Asina O'Neill quit. She quit social media. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? There's a big news item on November 3rd. If you're over 30, you don't care about this at all. <coughs> But if you're under 30, Asina O'Neill is an Australian media darling who is one of the most famous social media personas. She had over 600,000 Instagram followers. People who she didn't know, but who loved her pictures so much that they followed her on Instagram. 200,000 YouTube followers, plus Tumblr and Snapchat. And she's announced this week that she's going off social media. And she announced it on social media. <laughs> she said this, everybody's doing it. We just keep putting up staged photos 
in desperate hopes that others will approve. I did it for likes. That's what she said. The reason why she obsessed over all of her pictures and did these crazy staged photographs was for the likes. She's changed her mind. She just says, I will never be defined by a number again. And you know, she is an extreme example, but she's not that far off from the way ordinary people do social media and like to get likes as well. Because likes are the currency of Facebook and Twitter, and the more likes you get, the more you feel validated. Now, wanting to be liked is as old as humanity. People have always wanted to be liked, get approval of their peers, etc. The thing that's so insidious about social media is that you can now quantify it. You can put a number on your popularity. Take my Facebook, for example. I have 2,141 friends. I'm Mr. Popular. I had coffee with them, every one of them last week. So I got to admit, I did a bit of a sick experiment over the last couple weeks because I knew this message was coming, and I tracked everything that was posted in the last few weeks on my Facebook page. So I posted this picture of me with my dad. You can tell we look a little bit alike there. So that's me and my dad. That picture got 160 likes, 160 likes. Then I had a picture of myself with my kids. These are my two of my kids and then their roommates while we were at college or while they were at college. And that one got 137 likes. I could draw the conclusion that you like my dad more than you like my kids. I had my son Josiah on his hoverboard that he made in honor of Back to the Future Day, and that one got 90 likes. I put a great Bible verse, 77 likes. <laughs> I had myself and Kelly in our Halloween costumes. I put that up on Facebook, 216 likes. I had an uh, so one of my friends posted one of my sermons on my Facebook page, a sermon that I poured my life out for, a sermon that I spilled my guts for and spent hours and hours in study and preparation to be able to make sure it was excellent. I had this sermon posted on Facebook, and it got three likes. <laughs> three likes. Someone else put Harris III and his message on my Facebook page, and that one only got one like which made me think that you like me more than Harris III, <laughs> like three times as much, <laughs> but that you'd rather see me in a Halloween costume than preaching a sermon. <laughs> now, can you see how sick and twisted this whole thing gets? Now, some of you are sitting there self-righteously pretending like you have never done this, but story after story tells about people who will post a picture in hope of getting likes, and then they check back like every five minutes to see how many likes their story or picture has. Well, Asina O'Neill said she was miserable as she pursued more likes. And the more she went after the likes, the more miserable she got. Her external popularity only revealed an inner emptiness, a hollow shell. And that's just true. A Facebook obsession doesn't reveal self-confidence, but deep insecurity and jealousy. It reminds me of a story that was told in the Old Testament a story of David and Saul. Saul, you may remember, was the king before David was the king. And he was bringing David up as one of his young generals. And David was having an immense amount of success as a general as he went to uh, accomplish his work uh, in, in battle. And David came back after a particularly successful campaign and a new song got invented. Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. It was like the ancient form of likes. And David was getting like 10 times as many likes as Saul was getting. And so Saul, instead of throwing a feast and saying, look what a great general I've got, Saul got jealous. And he started hunting David down. Well, in ancient form, this is what likes can do to your soul, and it impacts even kings. And today, whether you're in middle school or the work environment, and the politics around you are screaming for attention, or if you're in the neighborhood, many of us just want to hear the same message. You're a winner. You have what it takes. You deserve it. Or just this simple sentence, I like you. I like you. 
Because as human beings, we're wired for approval. But likes, whether they're electronic likes or in-person likes, likes are just an illusion. Just an illusion. Time for a little truth here, friends. Likes in person or online are an illusion of grandeur that betrays a deep emptiness on the inside. And the more you're manipulating your external world in order to get validation, the more it belies an internal need to be filled with something bigger. God designed us to be able to be filled with something bigger, not to get our needs met from the outside world. Of course, there is a model for this. But before we go there, I want to take us through a little bit of an exercise together, okay? So uh, whether you're here in this room or online or joining us in Access, go ahead and close your eyes. And uh, we're going to do some imagination. So if you want to lean your head back, that's good. Don't fall asleep. But just close your eyes. And I want you to imagine yourself approaching God. Approaching God. I'm not going to tell you what he looks like or what his response is. Just for you, just as you are, right now coming before God, what is it like? What are your emotions, his emotions, facial expressions? I'm going to give you a few minutes of silence just to imagine this unfolding. Go ahead and imagine yourself approaching God. All right, you can go ahead and open up your eyes if you want. So what was it like when you saw God? Did you see somebody who likes you? Was there approval that was there? Was there disappointment in his face? Did you feel guilty because you had some junk that you carry with you into the relationship? Was there condemnation that came from God as you approached him? Did his face light up? Did you crawl into his lap? What was the scene like as you approached God? Well, we're going to take a look at what God's attitude is towards us a little bit here today. Uh, but before we look at God's attitude towards us, we're going to take a look at God's attitude towards his son, Jesus. Because Jesus is our model for life and peace and validation. He was human just like we are. He knew all of the temptations that we know, including the desire to be liked by other people. And yet he was totally secure. And I'm convinced there was a very clear place where this security came from. So turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, we're going to be taking a look at a few short verses, uh, verses 16 and 17. These are verses that are at Jesus' baptism. Verses of Jesus' baptism, it says this. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. And with him, I am well pleased. Stop right there. Have you ever noticed that this is the ultimate Trinitarian moment? Ultimate Trinitarian moment. You've got the Father and his voice booming from the clouds down in front of all the people. You've got the Son in his bodily, human body form there in front of the people being baptized. And then you've got the Holy Spirit coming down and alighting on him like a dove. Now, artists have pictured this in different ways. Some have thought it's kind of the Holy Spirit's kind of like shimmering light coming down on Jesus. Some have taken this more literally and said it was like there really was a dove that was coming down and, and falling uh, on Jesus as it came down, that there really was this kind of being from the sky that came down on him. And we don't know what the Holy Spirit looks like. We know it probably did not look like a beanie baby. <laughs> But the Holy Spirit came in a way that was present. And roll with the beanie baby here for a minute because it'll become important as we head a little bit later on in the message. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together at the same moment. And did you notice 
the words that came from the Father. I mean, imagine how this would make Jesus feel to hear these words in front of all of the people as he emerged his very first moment in ministry. He gets these words, this is my son whom I love and in him I am well pleased. Man, kids need to hear those words. And Jesus was likely at that point without his own earthly father, Joseph. Most scholars think that sometime between the age of 12, when we see Jesus and his father at the temple, and the age of 30, when the ministry started and you don't see Joseph at all, that at some point during that time, Joseph died. So by now, Jesus was fatherless, but his heavenly father is there. And his heavenly father is saying, this is my boy. I am happy with him, and I love him. And do you know what's most remarkable about this? He says this before Jesus did anything. Like, before he did a miracle, before he raised anybody from the dead or healed a blind man, before he died on the cross, before he raised from the dead, before he started his ministry journey, at that point, God loved him and God approved of him. This is my son. I thought about that with my own kids. I thought about the day that I brought my firstborn home from the hospital. Those of you who are parents, most parents can remember that day that they brought their firstborn child home from the hospital. I remember the little outfit he was wearing. It was a homemade fighting Illini outfit that Kelly made. And I remember the feelings that were overwhelmed in my soul in that moment. And uh, I just, my heart was bursting out of me with love for this little squirmy thing. I didn't realize that it was there inside of me, but you know what was not inside of me? I didn't go, Caleb, I'm going to withhold my approval from you until you're 18. If you got straight A's, you're in, and I'll love you. You know, I didn't say when I brought Casey home from the hospital, Casey, if there comes a day when you have a six-figure income... Then I will tell you that I love you. I didn't say, Josiah, build a rocket ship that goes to the moon and back, and then I will give you my praise. No. From the moment they came out of the womb, I love those kids. And the truth of the matter is, when my kids screw up, and trust me, my kids screw up, when they screw up, it doesn't make me feel alienated from them. It makes me want to draw closer to them in order to help instruct them and guide them on a path that will lead them to be productive individuals and men and women of God and to be able to make good choices and grow up to love God. When my kids are a mess, it makes me pray even harder for them. I think God's response to all of us is the same. It's the same as it was to his son Jesus. It's the same as a healthy father is to their own kids. I love you before you prove a thing in this life. I love you. The love was already there. There is nothing that you can do to make me love you more. There's nothing that you could do to make me love you less. I just love you. Now, I know that not everybody in this world has a dad who loves them unconditionally. Not everybody has heard that voice of approval that all of us yearn for. None of us have heard that voice come out of the sky the way that Jesus has. But I do think, wouldn't it be cool if there was a heavenly voice of fatherly love that gives us that same kind of approval And I want to point you to a passage in the Bible that talks about that. This is Romans chapter 8. So flip in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 14 through 17. And I think some of the parallels with Jesus' baptism will become clear pretty quickly. It says this. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, or if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. 
Okay, friends, this is a great passage to just drink in and to take into your lives. If you're somebody who likes to memorize the Bible, this is a great passage for you to be memorizing. But for those of you who are a little bit new, let me start at the beginning here. Because it talks about those who are led by the Spirit of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. We ask ourselves the question, what does it mean to be led by the Spirit of God. Well, there comes a point in every single person's life where a decision has to be made, where you become confronted with a certain set of facts. The fact that Jesus of Nazareth really was a real human being, that he really did live a human life, that he really did live perfectly where nobody else could live perfectly, that he really did die on the cross, And that his death was a historic, real death. And that it was a death that he didn't deserve. Because all of humanity had messed up and hurt and offended God and were under the death sentence of God. Jesus said, I'll step in the gap and I'll take the death sentence for you so that you can walk away scot-free. And then from the backside of that, he said, uh, and then I'll rise from the dead so that you can have new life and experience eternal life. His death, his resurrection on your behalf. And the decision every human being has to make is, will I trust this? Will I believe it and take it on for myself? And for those who take it on for themselves, they not only get forgiveness of sins and eternal life, but they get this powerful thing, and that is that the Holy Spirit floats in and lands right in your life. And as he's in the middle of your soul, he does a few key things for you. He convicts you when you mess up. He comforts you when you're in trouble. He leads your life. That's what this passage is talking about. Those who are led by the Spirit. He leads your life to be able to help you make the kinds of decisions that will honor God and lead you towards truth. And and he empowers you to live the kind of life that God wants you to live. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and leading you if, in fact, you trust in Jesus and his death and his resurrection. But it gets even better than that. Because the passage says, when the Spirit of God lives inside of you, you are a child of God. Not a slave. Not an employee. Not a grunt for God. You are a child of God. You've come into a family that brings you life. Now, you don't have to enter into this family if you don't want to. People can choose to live where they want. You can choose to live in the world of likes where there's the father of lies who wants to take advantage of your world and make you insecure for the rest of time. Or you can live underneath the rule of your heavenly father who wants to adopt you into into your life, adopt you into his life, And then give you the Holy Spirit and life and peace and everything that comes along with that. And when you do, you can cry out to him and you cry out, Abba, Father. You know where that idea Abba comes from? That word Abba is the ancient word for daddy (laughs) or dada. You ever notice when kids come out and they very first start talking, one of the very first sounds they make is this sound. Ba, or abba, 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 abba. In the United States, we think they're saying, oh, look, he's saying ball, ball, right? Ba, ba. In the ancient world, the dads would say, oh, look, he's saying my name. Listen to him, abba, 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 abba. Before he says mama, he's saying abba, abba. And so dads would claim that name, but what it became known as is this is the most intimate way that you can talk about your daddy. This is what little kids would call their daddy, Abba. And when we're adopted into God's family, we're adopted not as slaves, but as sons, so that we can have an intimate relationship with God. And then we get access to God. Whenever we need access, we have access to him because he's our daddy. It's a funny thing. As I was writing these very words on Monday morning, during my sermon prep time where nobody in the world is allowed to bother me, my phone rings. And it's my daughter Casey in Kentucky calling me up. Now, what do you think I did during my sacred no interruption time and my daughter calls? 
I answered the phone. Of course I did. Because I love to hear from my daughter, even if it's interrupting my sacred time. And we sat and we talked for about a half hour, and I took great joy in that interruption. I remember a few years back, about eight years ago, my son Josiah was involved in all the kids' programs that happened here on Wednesday nights. And he had a ball coming out for the programs on Wednesday nights. Well, on Wednesday nights, I usually have governing board meetings that happen at the same time. So imagine my 10 bosses, you know, all gathered around the big table. We're praying hard. We're solving the problems of the world. And all of a sudden, an eight-year-old kid comes busting in the room. And Josiah did every single week. He knew where we met. And he would come bust in the room, run over to my chair, give me a big hug, and then go to the snack table and scam some governing board snacks. (laughs) Which is the reason he really came in the room. But he knew that he could get away with that. (laughs) Why? Because I'm his dad. And he knows whenever he busts in the room, he's going to get a hug from me. Even if it's when I'm meeting with the governing board. He would do that over and over again. Well, imagine this. Imagine you have that same kind of access to your dad who's in heaven. And it doesn't matter what kind of run the universe meetings he's having with the Trinity. He loves to get interrupted. You got his cell phone number. And you can go straight to him. Talk to him anytime. Why? Because you are his son. You are his daughter. And he loves you. And he loves to hear from you. You're a child of God. And this is a truth that every single one of us has to claim. You have access to God. You are a child of God. I am a child of God. Someone say those words. Someone say, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. You should say that, self, say that to yourself every single day. That when you imagine yourself coming before God, you imagine a God who loves you, who wants you to give him a hug, who wants you to sneak up on him, who wants you to hang out with him, no matter what he's doing, that he wants you there. The Spirit of God lives inside you, and you are a child of God. Now, at this point, some people get confused. If you read your Bible a little bit, there are some places that talk about how God lives inside of you. That makes you a child of God. But there's some other places in the Bible that talk about how you make your home in God, or you live in Christ. You ask yourself the question, which one is it? Am I in Christ or is the Spirit in me? Is God in me? Am I in God? I can't quite get it all figured out. So let's look at a couple of Bible verses related to that. If you head up uh, Romans to the first verse in that chapter that you're in right now, Romans 8, 1, says this. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I bolded in Christ here. Because this is one of over 100 passages in the Bible that uses that phrase about being in Christ. It's one of our most important pieces of identity for those of us who trust in Christ, that we are in Christ. And we see that phrase popping up all over the place. Very interesting study is to look at what does it mean to be in Christ. Well, in this passage, there is a key truth that comes along with that. Because there is therefore now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. Because you see, this amazing thing happened. At the cross of Jesus, not only was all of your junk forgiven, taken away, but all of God's perfection was transferred to you. And friends, God knows about all of your junk, He knows you completely. He knows about that thing that you did 12 years ago or 12 days ago. And you're still wracked with guilt about it. He knows those words that you said to your spouse that scarred them pretty deep. He knows that your Facebook profile doesn't match your inner world. And you're playing games with people, maybe even playing games with your small group, pretending to be something that you're not. He knows the secrets that you never tell, not even your closest friends. And he loves you anyway. When you come before him, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
And if you imagine a God when you come before him who's scolding you, pointing his finger at you, disappointed in you, you're imagining the wrong God. Because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And can I explain this out just a little bit here? You serve a God who not only loves you so much that he would die for you, you serve a God who likes you. <laughs> and this is an important distinction, isn't it? Because a lot of us think God loves us because he's obligated to, right? God so loved the world, so that must include me in it. But it's not really anything about me that he particularly loves. Like a parent has to love their kids when they come out of the womb, so God has to love me. But he doesn't. God loves you and he likes you. He made you the way you are. He's been following your story from the day that you were born. He has compassion on you when you're messing up and takes joy in you when you're experiencing success. God loves you and God likes you. It's like getting a big, fat, nail-scarred thumbs up coming out of the sky. And friends, this like is the only like that matters. This is the like that overcomes every single other like in your life. God likes you. And there's no condemnation when you come before him. There's nothing that you could do to be liked more by God. and nothing you could do to be liked less by God. You are a child of the Most High God. And when you're found in Christ, there is no condemnation. No condemnation. Let's look at another verse that talks about being in Christ. It says, it's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. You guys picking this up? That when Jesus comes into your life, he transfers all of his goodness to you. He becomes for you righteousness, holiness, and redemption. And whatever junk and mess you've seen in your past, instead of engaging in that, or instead of being seen as that, you are seen as holiness and righteousness and redemption. It's been said in our culture that some people, some people are who they think they are. Some people are who others think they are. And more perceptive people will say, some people are who they think other people think they are. But the truth of the matter is, you are who God thinks you are. You are who God says you are. And if God says that you are the very righteousness, holiness, and redemption of Jesus, then that is exactly what you are. And when you come before him, you come before him pure. So that when God sees us, he sees Jesus. Now, one more verse that talks about what it means to be in Christ. One more verse. It says this. So in Christ Jesus, this is Galatians chapter 3. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So baptism, the idea of baptism is it's the symbolic external uh, uh, symbol of the internal thing that's happened in your life, your internal choice. So internally, you say, I'm going to choose to follow God. Well, when you get baptized, it's like the old you disappears into the water and a brand new you comes out. The old has gone and the new has come. And in that newness of life, when you're baptized into Christ, you come out of the water and you put some new clothes on. And the clothes that you put on are the clothes of Jesus. So that when God sees you, he doesn't see your old junk. He sees the power of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus. And this is good news, amen? Because I don't know about you, I'd much rather look like Jesus than look like me. Let me see if I can take this bit of mystery and make it a little bit more understandable before we leave. Because I know I've thrown a lot of random truths at you and some of them feel in conflict. So uh, here's for our illustration. This is you. Okay? At least when you're being transparent, this is you. And I've told you that when you trust in Jesus, well, when you trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and he begins to live inside of you. And he comforts you, and he convicts you, and he guides you, and he leads you, and he gives you the kind of power that it is to live in Jesus. And this is really good news. But then in addition to that, we've learned that you are not only filled with the Holy Spirit, 
but you are in Christ. So let's assume that this represents Christ. The Bible teaches that you make your home in Christ. And that way, when God looks at you, what does God see? God sees Christ first and foremost. You've been clothed with Christ, so he sees the blue and not you. I just made up that rhyme right on the spot right there. Isn't that good? And I, I hope you can see this, but inside of you, you can also see the Holy Spirit. So you got Jesus, you can see the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad that when God looks at you, this is what he sees? Not your mess, not your junk. And this becomes another one of those Trinitarian moments. Because you got the Spirit on the inside of you. You've got the uh, clothing of Christ all over you. And then you have the voice of God. The voice of God who comes and says, Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've lived a life that's full of the Holy Spirit. You've lived your life clothed in Christ. And there's nothing that I could do to be more pleased with you than that. <laughs> Asin O'Neill said that she hopes to start a movement where an individual's worth is not determined by their physical attributes or social media influence. I got news for you, Asina. Jesus started that movement a long time ago. And he fills us up and he gives us the power to be able to live in him. Guys, you are not who other people say you are. You're not the number of likes that you get. Your worth is not determined by how good looking or tall or rich you are. You are who God says you are. If he says you are righteousness, you're righteousness. If he says you're redemption, you're redemption. If he says you are a child of God, you are a child of God. Someone say, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. This is good news, amen? amen? And the deeper you dig into Jesus, the more you make your home in him, the more his life will be made known in you, the bigger he will look to you, and the more his glory will shine out for your life. It's all about making your home in Jesus, and it will transform you from the inside out. Now, I'd love to pray for you this morning as I close, and I'm going to prayer, uh, pray a really good prayer because Paul wrote it. It's a prayer that comes out of the book of Ephesians chapter 3. And it's an inspired prayer that not only has the Trinitarian idea, but also the idea that you are a child of God. And if you want this week, I'd encourage you to read this prayer over and over. It's in Ephesians 3. It starts at verse 14. But for now, just bow your heads and go ahead and listen to this prayer and let it wash over you. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his, his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to go ahead and respond to Mark's message. And we just invite you to sing right where you're seated. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have him than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain 
than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Well, that really is the truth, isn't it? Like, I'd rather have Jesus than all that stuff. You can have the money, you can have the power, you can have the likes, you can have anything that this world gives you. I'd trade it all. I'd trade the whole mountain of it for Jesus and Jesus alone.